Dr. David Sabatini is an American scientist and professor of biology at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, as well as a member of the Whitehead Institute for Biomedical Research. He is known for his important contributions in the areas of cell signaling and cancer metabolism, most notably the discovery of mTOR more than 20 years ago. Since then, Dr. Sabatini has continued to work on better understanding this complex regulator of our metabolism. So I suspect that most of uh, the audience have already heard of mTOR, and today we are very honored to have uh, Dr. David Sabatini of MIT, who discovered mTOR over 20 years ago. So uh, Dr. Sabatini, welcome to Modern Healthspan, and thank you for, for taking the time today. Thank you for having me. So you discovered mTOR um, 20, more than 20 years ago now, and your lab has continued to work on it. And, I know that they've come up with, uh, discovered some of the, the main things like the mTOR1 and 2 complexes. And so can you give like an overview of mTOR, what, what its role is within the body uh, and, and how it functions? Sure, and I'd be, I'd be happy to, yes. I'd be, it is true that I've worked on basically mTOR my entire career, which is a little atypical for a scientist. Scientists tend to do something in their graduate work, then postdoc, and then move in different directions. And so I've always kept a, mTOR part of the lab, which uh, shows you my undying love and, and fascination with it. And I think partly that is, or mostly that is, because mTOR has been turned out to be much more fascinating than I ever imagined when we first identified it. So mTOR, and really, I think to, to, to speak more, more correctly, I think we have to say mTOR complex one, which is a, a set of proteins that come together to make a protein complex of which mTOR is what we would call the catalytic subunit. So that is the, the subunit that has the activity, which is an enzymatic activity, which can phosphorylate other proteins, put phosphates on other proteins. And this is a common signaling modality. So the way that I like to analogize uh, mTOR is to think about a building site. So think about that you want to make a building and there are many processes you have to do to make a building like lay a foundation, have plumbers, electricians, put glass in, you know, making a big building. And you also need to make a lot of decisions based on what's happening around you. So the weather, for example, the availability of certain contractors that need to come in, um, how long it'll take to pour concrete, right? Uh, many, many things, thousands of things, right? And so how does a building site deal with this? Well, it has a general contractor, right? A general contractor is the one that hires all the subcontractors, electricians, plumbers, et cetera, and also makes all these upstream decisions. mTOR in essence is that for the cell. So if a cell wants to make another cell, therefore it needs to make more of itself, it needs to make more biomass. Every single part of the cell needs to be duplicated. The lipids, the proteins, the sugars, the DNA, the RNA, everything. Right. Mm. The cell has to do that in a coordinated and intelligent fashion based on the resources it has at hand. For example, the nutrients. Nothing can be made if you don't have the amino acids and the glucose molecules and the ATPs and the oxygen, everything that needs to be, to be uh, used to generate biomass. mTOR basically sits at the center of a pathway that has lots of antennas detecting the presence or absence of all of these uh, nutrients. And then downstream, what we typically call downstream, regulating all of those processes that I'm analogizing to the subcontractors, the proteins that make the lipids, the proteins that make the RNAs, the proteins that make the membrane get bigger, the proteins that help the cytoskeleton expand. So that's how I like to think of mTOR. And, and that's why it's turned out to be so important uh, because it's really at the center of this process of how we make more cell material and measuring and then implementing that a program to make more. Right. So you say measuring. So what is it measuring? I mean, it, it, may, it must make decisions. OK, we're going to do we're going to grow or we're not going to grow. So right. what does it make those decisions based on? Many, 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 many inputs. And in fact, it's almost hard to find an input that mTOR does not sense. And, and to some extent, that is what told us, you said, well, I've been working on this for a long time. To some extent, it was that realization that made us think this really matters because the cell cares about regulating mTOR in response to almost anything. So when I say anything, any kind of nutrient, glucose, lipids, amino acids, oxygen, energy sources, ATP, lack of stresses, 
lack of DNA damage, lack of hypoxia, lack of osmotic damage, lack, lack of high temperature, lack of low temperature, and then also the presence of growth factors, right? What distinguishes a multicellular body, such as ours, an organism such as ours, versus a unicellular organism, which typically cares mostly about nutrients in its environment and the absence of stresses. In a multicellular organism such as ours, cells communicate with each other, right? Mm -hmm. They talk to each other. different tissues, talk to remember, the pancreas, talk to the rest of our body, for example, through insulin. So the mTORC1 pathway in multicellular organisms also has an important growth factor sensing arm that's absent in unicellular organisms because they don't have growth factors. They don't have hormones because they're, they're unicellular. And, you know, they have, they have primitive sensing uh, uh, sort of communication uh, molecules, but they don't have this very, very elaborate network of intercellular communication that, that we have. So would you say that mTOR is mTOR1 is kind of like an AND gate or an OR gate. It, it has to have everything to activate or it has to have like a few things. Right, that's a great question. And, and it's more like an AND gate. In fact, what, what mTOR is really built, it, it's actually almost the opposite than the way we study it. It's really built to detect a poor condition. The assumption the cell has is the conditions are good. And then mTOR, what it does is, is in the absence of any of which are many, many possible good conditions, or for example, the absence of gases, the absence of, of, of oxygen, it puts up the red flag and shuts things down. So it truly is an AND gate. And if you look at how we draw the pathway and how we've even argued about it, we've argued as a coincidence detector, which in essence is an AND gate, right? Many conditions have to be met for the pathway to be on. What it protects against is a poor condition. So it's, it's a great question. It's not, you know, and it makes sense, right? You can't make a cell with amino acids, but no glucose. It doesn't make any sense to turn on mTOR when you have amino acids, but look, lo and behold, we have no oxygen, right? So, so it really has to be an end game. It's a, right. Okay. Um, so you, we talked about mTOR really being mTOR1. So can you briefly describe it? So what is mTOR1 and mTOR2 and, and how do they, they differ? Yeah. So, so in the earliest days, when we first identified mTOR, it, it was very obvious, even, even in some of the assays that I used to follow what came to be called mTOR in, in fractions, for example, from rat brains, where I was purifying it from, it was very clear that it didn't act alone, that it had to have friends, right? Mm -hmm. And this, is, in general, can be true of, of, of many proteins, is that they act complex with other, other proteins, uh, interacting with other proteins. And so, of course, we we're very keen on identifying what these proteins were, and, and, it, and it did turn out to be actually critical for understanding this whole pathway. And what we now realize is that there really are two major mTOR-containing complexes in the cell, mTOR complex one, mTOR one, and a lot of what we just discussed is really mTOR one. mTOR one, in, in many ways, is by by far, I would argue, in mammalian systems, the more fascinating mTORC1 complex because it can detect all of these things, which leads to lots of questions. How do you do that, right? Mm -hmm. mTORC2 in, in some ways uh, is a little more mundane. Uh, it's part of a pathway called the PI3 kinase pathway, which is involved in sensing insulin and other growth factors. It's an important uh, complex, um, but from a, from a biological point of view is less interesting because it seems to do less things. Um, it also doesn't seem to have as important a role in health span and lifespan as mTORC1. Um, and in many ways, and I've written this, some people have argued that, that this is not a good interpretation, but we've written this, that mTORC2 in a way is part of the pathway that activates mTORC1 in the growth factor pathway, right? So if insulin is one of this, the stimuli that turns on mTORC1, mTORC2 is part of the pathway that conveys that insulin signal to mTORC1. So, so in scientific parlance, we would say mTORC2 is upstream of mTORC1. Because mTORC1 though detects so many things and there are so many pathways upstream of mTORC1, it, it isn't such a unique thing to say, uh, but it's sort of funny to think that mTOR, which is in both of those, is sort of both upstream and downstream of itself. Right. So I, I remember one of the diagrams had um, like insulin actually going into mTORC1 through what, red, was it? So it, it comes in like both channels. No, no, no. So the way, so that's, it's part of the same pathway. So it's, it's, you know, insulin goes to the insulin receptor, which then activates PI3 kinase, which then activates another kinase called AKT, 
which then suppresses a protein complex called TSC, right. which is the, normally the repressor of red. And so that's how you get to that. So it, so it actually is, you know, no pathway. We, we like to draw pathways in a linear way. They're clearly not linear. But, but REB, um, mTOR2 are, are all part of the same pathway. They're all part of it. Okay, okay, got it. Um, okay, excellent, thank you. So what I'd like, thank you all for watching. I hope that you found the video informative. Please do hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel, and hit the bell button for new video release notifications. It encourages us to continue to create more videos about anti-aging and extending healthy lifespan. Thank you so much for your kind support. I wish you all well and we'll speak to you again soon.